Marcos, thank you very much, and a special thanks to The Economist, to Daniel, to Nectaria, and to the staff for uh, inviting me back and um, allowing me to participate in this very distinguished, and I would add, timely challenge. Uh, I've been a student of the decade of the 1930s for a good part of my life. I've tried not to become a prisoner of history, but a student of history. And for me, there are two central and enduring lessons from the 1930s that perhaps we have ignored at our peril. The first is the failure of appeasement as a policy. Churchill was asked by Roosevelt during the Second World War, what do you think we ought to call this war? And Churchill's response almost instantaneously was the unnecessary war, suggesting that there were various moments between 1933, January, when Hitler became chancellor, until September 1st, 1939, when German forces invaded Poland, when the war might have been stopped. And the second enduring lesson was the failure of imagination of many otherwise thoughtful, intelligent leaders in that decade who refused to believe that what Hitler himself had written in 1924 and 25 in the Landsberg prison, which became known as Mein Kampf, would actually translate into state policy if Hitler could achieve power. Instead, there was that old political science theory that governance moderates, and at the end of the day, if you can't pick up the garbage and deliver the mail, you can't for long function in government. Fast forward. We, the world, watched as Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, step by step, slice by slice, tested us while moving into Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Donbass, Crimea, and looking for all other vulnerable spots, I'll mention Transnistria as well. And our reaction, whatever we may have thought about it, was clearly not how he perceived it. He himself, had said for the world, in a way, as Hitler had said for the world, and I quote, the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. Few chose to believe him. And I think, Marcos, while we are engaged now in global reimagination, global threats, global challenges, we have to save some time and space to understand what went wrong within the thoughtful spaces of Western analysis and decision making that allowed us to ignore those two central lessons, that allowed us to convince ourselves that through trade, investment, energy dependency, we were actually creating a more peaceful and stable and predictable world. And I don't think that those are issues that can easily be brushed aside, even in the, the moment. My second point, the German Marshall Fund was mentioned, as was the 75th anniversary, Ian, of the Marshall Fund itself. This is a moment in time, I believe, where once again, the world is yearning for visionary, courageous, determined, leadership, statesmanship, not political ship, statesmanship, the people who will guide us both through the immediate crisis and beyond. And from an American perspective, there was no more productive moment in defining a new international rules-based order than the Truman administration that began on April the 12th, 1945, 
and continue through January the 20th, 1953, of which the Marshall Plan was but one example. And in Europe, the vision of Robert Schumann, Jean Monnet, supported over time by Paul Henri Spach, by Alcidi de Gasperi, by Konrad Adenauer, who also understood that it was no longer time for palliatives or band-aids or press statements. It was a time, as the defense minister of Greece said a few moments ago, for action, for redefining and reimagining. And I would say, to fast forward, this is that moment once again for visionary, courageous leadership in the short term to get us through what I believe, Marcos, inevitably will become Ukraine fatigue. What is now a consensus in the West, in the EU, in NATO, in the Transatlantic Alliance about Ukraine is going to begin to wither, I fear, as the war continues, as Ukraine valiantly uh, resists, but as food prices go up, gas prices go up, inflation gallops, and people begin to ask in their own countries, why is Ukraine more important than us? And what does that mean for political stability? And longer term, my last point, what's the next great idea? What's the next great imagination for the like-minded countries, the community of democracies? And I think in a way the answer begins right here in the example of Greece, Cyprus, and Israel, and the concentric circles that we know about involving other East Med, North African, and Middle Eastern countries that are taking on the issues of energy, of environment, of defense, in order to establish a new concept in the international order which is so desperately needed at this moment in time.